We're going to continue our, our journey through the story, which is just breaking the Bible into 31 uh, key events, key chapters. We're on chapter 8 today. Um, and uh, we'll, I'll take some time in the message to kind of bring everybody up to speed on where we're at. But to see in this period known as the period of the judges, if you're familiar with the Old Testament books of the Bible, there's a whole book dedicated to this about 350 years of Israel's history. And as we, as we look at it, we're not going to look at the whole book today, but just want to point out a pattern that occurs in this book, and we can learn from it because a similar pattern, I'm sure, occurs in, in many, uh, if not all of our lives, um, whether in short seasons or in long seasons or perhaps even on a daily basis. This weekend, we have the opportunity to uh, celebrate veterans, and for all of those that are among us that have that title, thank you. Um, I've said this before, it, 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 was, uh, it, it was never really my heart's desire to be in that line of work, but I, my heart is certainly grateful for all those that did. And um, If I was going to be, I, I wanted to be a, a fighter pilot, and back in my day when they were recruiting, they said, you're too tall and your eyes are too blind. So um, that was about the only... The only small interest I had. But thank you, uh, honestly, uh, for, for serving us and giving us, giving me uh, the, the freedom and privilege just to be here this morning without the threat of getting in trouble for speaking the truth of God's word and his love into each of your hearts. You know, thinking about this section we're going to cover today in the story and being Veterans Day weekend. I, I'm not a military strategist. There's, there's probably about three battles, three wars that I've been intrigued by and read a little bit over the years, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, and World War II. And what stands out to me in, in looking at these different battles and these different conflicts is at times what leads to the success or failure, the win or loss, the victory or defeat of a given campaign in a given army. And as I, as I reflect back on some of the battles without any specific one in mind, sometimes just the sheer firepower and the sheer strength of one army over another allows a victory to be won. It's just, it's, they're outnumbered, they're outgunned, and the advantage goes to the one that has that. But on the other hand, sometimes the army that is less that has less firepower and has less personnel, comes away with a victory. And you ask, well, why is that? Well, then perhaps some of the, the strategy of the commanders or the, the leadership or the, the deception that goes into uh, perhaps appearing larger than you are. And so some, oftentimes strategy, um, tactics play an important role uh, in the battle. Sometimes uh, th there are things outside the realm of the general's planning that come into play, such as nature and weather, <laughs> that, that perhaps one army, one force is, is better prepared for than the other, or sometimes it just it, it causes the conflict to cease before perhaps it would have played out differently if the weather was different. And so you can look at military battles, and maybe some of that, that's more of an interest to you, and you can uh, read about generals, and you can read about battalions, and you can read about victories and losses, and have your own evaluation of why that occurs. But one of the things that, that, that threads through, at least the, the battles that I've read about, that is perhaps more important than the size of your army, the tactics and strategy of the general, or the weather itself, it is the heart of the soldier. A lot of times the term morale is brought up. And if an if a army has a good morale, that means their heart is ready to engage. If it has poor morale, it means the hearts are not ready to engage. And you can have the greatest artillery, the greatest the, the physical armaments, you can have the greatest personnel, you can have the greatest commanders, you can have the greatest tactics, you have the greatest strategy, and the greatest weather. But if the heart of the soldiers is not ready to engage in combat, you're destined for defeat. 
in this greatest story ever told, as we look at the wins and losses, and again, we look at it perhaps a, another military slanted portion of the scripture. In, in the upper story of this series that we've been on and reading through the scripture, the, the upper story reality is the battle for people's hearts. And while we see military tactics and strategy and at times uh, the, the army of Israel being greater than the one that they're invading and at times they're lesser. In this section I think of Gideon who went with 300 men and defeated the army of Midian of thousands. But it wasn't their tactics because all they did was blow horns and break jars. <laughs> but it was their hearts that trusted that the Lord would use that to defeat the army of Midian and it did as the Midianites turned on each other and really defeated themselves. So as we look at the story again and engage with it again today, I, I just want you to keep this in mind that God's desire back then, his desire today, is victory in our hearts. And that our hearts remain loyal to him every day of our life. Because we see in this period of the judges, a pattern that certainly communicates otherwise. And, and I want us, because, not just so I have some company, because I saw it myself, that this pattern that plays out in the judges, it's easy to go, well, how could they do that? And why did they do that? And why couldn't they just follow the Lord? And we can ask all these questions, but I want you to, we're going to come back to and, and ask the question about ourselves as well. Because history is recorded for us, these events are recorded for us, and God, in His infinite wisdom, decided to preserve them thousands of years so that we could talk about them today and learn from them. So let's do that. I'm going to start in general to just give, what is this pattern that evolves, and we've seen it before, but we see it really play out in the, the book of Judges. Then I want to give you a specific example, and then I want to look at our own lives and apply that pattern to our lives. The first scripture I want to put in front of you is on your sheet it says Joshua chapter 2 and on the screen it says Joshua chapter 2. It's not Joshua, it's Judges chapter 2. I think Joshua is still on my mind because that's where we're kind of at in this period of history of transition from the leadership of Joshua to this period of the Judges. Now maybe just a little bit of lead up so if, if you missed last week you can kind of track with us. Moses has led the people out of Israel They've, they were going to enter the land, but 10 spies said, it's too big, too strong, we can't take it. The 10 spies infiltrate the camp of Israel. The camp of Israel has that same defeatist attitude. And they say, nope, this is too big. This is just a suicide mission. We shouldn't do it. And so God says, we should do it, but you're doubting me, so I'm going to give you 40 years to think about it. And so he gives them 40 years, and that generation that, uh, that doubted dies off, and now Joshua takes the new generation and leads them into the land of Israel. There's major campaigns that they engage in, Jericho being the first and others that play out in the book of Joshua, and together the army of Israel does the big fighting throughout the region of Israel. And at the end of Joshua's reign, it becomes time for the division of the land. So God is, is directing uh, the 12 tribes of Israel, each get a portion of land. And I won't go into all, all that, but they, they're divided up. And so one of, one of the things that they were to do is when they got to their piece of land where they were, to, they were to finish the work of eliminating the Canaanites, not because Israel was such a great nation and not because these were superior people, but because God was using the Israelites as an arm of his justice to take care of the evil hearts of the people who lived in the land. The problem was, they didn't do it. They didn't finish the work. And as a result, this is how the book of Judges describes the climate, the culture that's going on in Israel at this time. Here it is. After that, uh, after that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, so this is not the generation that wandered in the wilderness, they already perished in the wilderness. This is the next generation that fought with Joshua in conquering the land. So that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers. Another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. We'll come back to that. It's a profound statement. 
Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of Egypt. In his anger against Israel, the Lord handed them over, uh, over to raiders who plundered them. He sold them to their enemies all around whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had sworn to them they were in great distress. So what, what happened here is perhaps you may say, well, this isn't anything new. You're right. In some ways, it's not anything new. But there's a few things in, in this pattern. I'm going to give you th- three words that they're, they're printed. And, and this is a pattern not worth repeating, <laughs> right? Sometimes we come across patterns that are like, okay, that, that's worth repeating. This one is not worth repeating, but it's worth understanding so we don't repeat it. The first part of this pattern is disobedience. Disobedience to what the Lord had given them. And so when you look at, I gave you three blanks to fill in. The, the, the first one is they failed to follow the Lord's direction. So remember that the Lord had said, I want you, when you go into this land, I want you to wipe out these people. And again, you know, from our culture and our society, you're like, wow, what is that all about? And again, a reminder, God told Moses to tell the people, this isn't because you're so great or you're so righteous, but because these people are so wicked. So this was a, 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 God used the army of Israel as a spiritual judgment on the people who were in the land. Now, these people were descendants from people we've heard of before, like Lot, who was the nephew of, of Abraham, of the, the sons of, of Noah, etc., that at some point in their culture's history, they knew the Lord, and their culture and their history drifted away from the Lord and served these other gods, Baal, Ashtoreth, fertility gods of, that they had developed. Not only did they fail to follow the Lord's direction, but where I paused in reading this portion of Scripture is they failed to tell the next generation. They failed to teach the next generation. A generation grew up that did not know the Lord and did not know what God had done for Israel. One generation. You're like, what happened? Why didn't moms and dads sit down as Moses had been directed to tell them, talk about these things when you walk along the road, when you sit down, when you have a meal together, when you go to bed, when you rise up, talk about these things. Why? Because they didn't have Google to go, who is Jesus Christ? They didn't have Siri to ask or Alexa. They didn't even have books to go to the library. They they didn't have scrolls in their tents. They had to rely on word of mouth. And the record, yes, that that Moses had written down and and also Joshua. But they didn't have personal copies of all that. And the way that these truths were passed on is parents to children, grandparents to grandchildren. But they failed to do that. And so this generation did not know the Lord or what the Lord had done for Israel. And the third thing that stands out is they failed to give God their veneration. I had direction and generation. I had to find another shun word that rhymed with those two. But they didn't. Remember, God, God had warned them. God had promised and warned them. The promise was, you be, you, here are my commands. <clears throat> you walk in them. You follow them. I will be your God, and you will be my people. You don't. I won't be your God, and you won't be my people. I will withdraw that. And so as they, it's because they did not wipe out the worship of these false gods, again, remember the battle here isn't against one race. It's not a, a racism thing. It's not an ethnicity thing. It's a heart thing. And what God was jealous for was the hearts of his people, and he didn't want them to be distracted by the Baals and the Asherah. That's why he wanted those gods wiped out and the people that worshiped them. That's why he said through Moses, you shall have no other gods before me. Because God's desire is for the hearts of every person. But the people failed to give God their veneration and in fact gave it to Baal and Ashtoreth, the gods of Egypt. In their disobedience, what comes of that, the last phrase we read, they were in great distress. The second part of this cycle is despair, 
And why does despair hit the camp of Israel, the, the nation of Israel? Well, because of their disobedience, these two things happen. The first is, the Lord removes his promises. Now, it's not that God says, you know, I gave that promise, but I'm going to renege it. But like I said, he promised both. He promised blessing as they would walk with him, and he promised curses as they would walk away from him. Not only through Moses, but Moses reminded them, and then Joshua gave again. Remember last week, if you had a chance to read, and I think we brought it up in uh, in some discussion last weekend too, you choose. You can go back to the gods of Egypt. You can serve these other gods, but as for me and my household, we are going to serve the Lord. Joshua did his best to set a pattern to say, do not give your heart to any other god and take the time in your household to proclaim the Lord and teach the Lord to the next generation. But what we have here at the beginning of Judges is a generation that failed. And God, the Lord, removes his promise of blessing and rather works out his promise of curses. The second thing that the Lord removes is his power. From any military engagement, the Lord had promised the nation of Israel, you go in with a heart of faith and I will defeat your enemies before you. It didn't matter if they were outnumbered. It didn't matter if they had a better general. It didn't matter if they had more firepower. It didn't matter what the opposition had. The secret weapon that the army of Israel had that wasn't so secret because the other city-states were trembling in fear is they had the Lord. They saw it at Jericho. They saw it throughout their campaign. The Lord was able to wipe out every army of the Canaanites. But because the people had disobeyed, the Lord said, you're on your own. You want to be on your own? You don't want me part of it? Fine. I'll, I'll let you do that and see how that, see how that works for you. And what we just read, whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them just as he had sworn to them. This wasn't, this, this wasn't new. The Lord said, this is how it's going to work. So we can't say, God, well, what, how come that you're so unfair and so unjust? He goes, I I told them. (laughs) I gave them this direction. And so when they realize what had happened, they cry out in their despair, and this is part of the pattern the judges too. It's not in what we just read, but I'll show you it in a moment, an example. That from their despair, they cry out to the Lord for deliverance. And the Lord in his grace, as the pattern repeats, as, they see, as the people see, we cannot do this without the Lord, they cry out to the Lord for deliverance. And he does provide deliverance. Two things. The Lord provided victory over the enemy, and the Lord provided peace in the land. So God raised up these judges. Now, when we think of judge, we think of someone sitting in front of a courtroom and hearing the case and going, guilty or innocent, here's your sentence, or here you're set, you're set free. Now, some of the people who were in this role carried out some of that wisdom, decision-making. But the term judges, these were individuals that God raised up to, to judge the enemy. And so we have in this account, in this, perhaps if you think of the judges, perhaps a couple of the more popular ones, you think of Samson. Everybody heard of Samson? Right? Here's Samson, you probably think of him, this big, strong guy that, uh, you know, he had the strength, God gave him the strength to, to do anything um, until he gave away the secret of his strength. He was deviated, uh, his heart, again, heart issue, his heart was, was taken away to a foreign a woman who deceived him, and, and God gave him strength one last time. Perhaps I remember in Sunday school, you have Samson between the two pillars of the, uh, the, the, the false god temple, and he's pulling him down, and that was his last hurrah. Or maybe think of, perhaps if you... If you know anyone from the book of Judges, Gideon, uh, I mentioned earlier, Gideon, Gideon, smiting Midian, that's how I remember him, (laughs) someone taught me that. He has thousands and God says, no, you just, 
and he whittles it down to 300 and takes them, surrounds the camp of Midian and the jars and the trumpets. And just by, I'm just curious, by show of hands, how many of you know Ehud? A couple of people know Ehud. All right, <clears throat> a couple of you were in first service. That doesn't count. I, I don't know, and in, in, some may say, you know what, Pastor Mike, I don't know what Ehud has anything to do with today's message. I'm going to make it fit because I'm like, this is my one chance to talk about Ehud in a sermon. And this is, this is one of those, just by the show of hands, tells me that, that they never taught you this in Sunday school. <laughs> this is one of those stories of the Bible that uh, a friend of mine, he did a series once, stories they never taught you in Sunday school. Um, because some of the stories of the Bible, honestly, they're, they're, they're not... Um, five, six-year-old stories, like they're just, they're kind of more uh, PG-13 or R-rated at times. And, and maybe for that reason, Ehud's there, because there's, there's a little bit of, but I, I'm going to take the risk because it's in the Bible. And, um, but for some reason, it's always intrigued me. And I, I, to this day, I can't really tell you exactly why, other than it's just kind of a, a bizarro story that has some facets to it, like of intrigue and, and uh, deception and just the characters involved, and, and perhaps um, at the end of this, um, the, the situation is not uncovered because they think he's using the bathroom, and, and maybe, maybe that's just been the quirk of it. So what does Ehud have to do? So I just want to point out, here's just one of, and, and as you read through Judges, you'll see the pattern that I just described, disobedience, despair, and deliverance. So Ehud is the guy that raised, God raises up, and I'm just going gonna, gonna to read it for you. It's not up on the screen. If you want to take out your device, it's a little bit longer. I just chose not to put it up on the screen, and you can just listen to it, or you can pull out a Bible, electronic or paper copy. So it's Judges chapter 3, verses 12. So this is early in the period of the Judges, and it, it begins this way. Once again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and because they did this evil, the Lord gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. I, I, Maybe it's the term Eglon. I don't know. Like, you know, how many people do you know by the name of Eglon? You know, if you have twin boys some days or grand boy, grandsons, you know, just name them Ehud and Eglon. I don't know. You know, it's like uh, Ehud and Eglon. And so the Moabites were descendants of Lot. So that's kind of where this culture, this group of people came from. And here's the pattern. Disobedience. Once again, because we're coming off of Othniel, who's another judge, and there was a time of peace, but once again... This, that, just that phrase, right? This wasn't the first time. Once again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And because they did this evil, the Lord gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. In this setting, the account goes on. Getting the Ammonites and Amalekites to join him, Eglon came and attacked Israel, and they took possession of the city of Palms. That's probably another name for Jericho. So Jericho had been resettled. The Israelites were subject to Eglon, king of Moab, for 18 years. So after this 18 years, again, the Israelites cry out to the Lord for help. They're like, this is enough. We're paying tribute. We're giving up our stuff to Eglon. Um, We don't know a lot what's going on, but it, it was not a fun environment to live under. And so this takes place for 18 years. So in the midst of despair, what did God's people do? Again, the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and he gave them a deliverer, Ehud, how many lefties are out there? Here's your shout out in the Bible. Left-handed Benjamite. So he's a descendant of Benjamin. Remember, Benjamin and Joseph were the two favorite sons of Jacob, so this is a descendant of J- uh, Benjamin. Left-handed guy, um, the son of Gera, the Benjamite. The Israelites sent him with tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. So he says, Ehud, you go take the tribute. That's like, you know, crops and money and payment, and takes it to Eglon. Which he, so he went to Moab, and, but now Ehud had made a double-edged sword about a foot and a half long. So in the scripture, it's a cubit, so it's from your elbow to the tips of your fingers. So my sword had been a little bit longer than some of yours, but about a foot and a half long, which he strapped to his right thigh underneath his clothing. So in Israel, they had concealed carry permits, right? They could, they could carry a concealed weapon. He strapped it to his thigh as he went to give tribute to Eglon. So he strapped it under his clothing, his right thigh. He presented tribute to Eglon, king of Moab, who was a very fat man. (laughs) Right? Like, I I tell you, you're never going to forget Eglon and Ehud after today's message. So he goes to Eglon, the large 
king of Moab, after Ehud had presented the tribute, he sent on their way the men who had carried it at the idols near Gilgal. So Gilgal was a place where the, the, the worship of the Lord was supposed to be taking place, but there are idols there set up instead. He himself turned back and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. So the king said, quiet, and all his attendants left. So Ehud plays out that I got a secret message for you that no one else can hear. And Eglon plays into that and like, oh, he's got a secret message for me. So he wants to hear Ehud out, but it's not the message he was expecting. Ehud then approached him while he was sitting alone in the upper room of his summer palace and said, I have a message from God for you. So if you're Eglon and someone says you have, someone has a message, what do you think they're going to do? I'm going to tell you something. That wasn't the message that Ehud had. As the king rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand and drew his sword from his right thigh and plunged it into the king's belly. Even the handle sank in after the blade, which came out his back. That's probably why they didn't tell you that in Sunday school, right? <clears throat> Ehud did not pull the sword out, and the fat closed over it. Then Ehud went out to the porch. He shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. After he was gone, the servants of Eglon came and found the doors of the upper room locked. They said he must be relieving himself in the inner room of the house because they didn't have you know, outhouses and that sort of thing, the chamber pot. They waited to the point of embarrassment. <laughs> Enough said. And when he did not open the doors of the room, they took a key and unlocked them. There they saw their Lord fall into the floor dead. While they waited, Ehud got away. He passed by the idols and escaped to Sirah. When he arrived there, he blew a trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went down with him from the hills, with him leading them. Follow me, he ordered, for the Lord has given Moab your enemy into your hands. So they followed him down, and taking possession of the fords of the Jordan that led to Moab, they allowed no one to cross over. At that time, they struck down about 10,000 Moabites, all vigorous and strong. Not a man escaped. That day, Moab was made subject to Israel, and the land had peace for 80 years. Thank you for letting me present Eglon in a worship service. But I, these are some of the intriguing stories that God used to deliver his people. And like I said, some of them are, are gross, bizarre. But again, God's intent is to deliver the hearts of his people back to himself. And in this case, he, he took care of Moab by taking out his leader, Eglon, and then 10,000 Moabites um, lost, their, lost in the battle as well. So this pattern, and it, 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 do take time to read through some of the other judges, and you'll see this. Disobedience, despair, cry out for help, and the Lord provides deliverance. So what does that have to do with us? Do you see this pattern in your own life? Maybe it's not as dramatic as Ehud and Eglon. Maybe it's not an invading army, but maybe it's a similar struggle that the Apostle Paul had. And I just want to share a few words from his letter to the Romans in chapter 7. He noticed the pattern. I want you to notice it myself to notice. And that pattern starts with disobedience. Because as Paul will say, we all have a sinful nature. We all have a sinful heart. He puts it this way. We go back to the Romans 7. He says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. You see, disobedience comes from a heart that is governed by sin. And we all have one. And the reason that this pattern repeated in Judges is because they, the next generation had a sinful nature too, and the next generation had a sinful nature too, and the next generation had a sinful nature too, all the way down to this generation, that we have a sinful nature too. And that sinful nature leads us to, to not want to honor our parents, and it leads us to want to cheat on our homework, and it leads us to want to 
to put our, our ego and ourself up in front. It leads us to want to put career and finances and money over God, and it leads us to, to, to put other things more important in our heart than worshiping the Lord. You just insert your specifics, and we realize, like the Apostle Paul, what's really going on here is the sinful nature that doesn't want to walk with the Lord, doesn't want to honor Him. Now, as we go through life, things may be pretty good, but at some point, I pray that God brings us to a realization that life without Him is not the way to live life, which leads us The only place our sinful nature is going to lead us is to despair. When life doesn't go right, and we despair of our eternal life. The Apostle Paul realized this. He says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? I realize I can't fix this heart condition on my own. The people of Israel cried out to the Lord for deliverance. When we realize we cannot fix our heart condition with the Lord on our own, it leads us to cry out to God for deliverance. And the Apostle Paul realized the very next verse says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He gives us the victory. You see, the only solution for the enemy of sin in our hearts is our Savior, Jesus. As you read through the book of Judges and you see God raise up these individuals to deliver Israel from a physical oppressor, his culmination of his deliverance is from spiritual oppression and for your heart through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And ultimately, Jesus is the deliverer that we all need, the one who went to the cross, who lived a perfect life, who gave us his perfect life took our punishment to the cross and rose from the tomb victorious to assure us that it is complete. The enemy has been defeated. What ensues when I know that sin in my heart is no longer what characterizes me, I am no longer accountable for it because God has in Christ paid for it? Well, what happened in the period of Judges? When the enemy was defeated, what happened in the land? There was a time of peace. What happens in our hearts when we realize that our enemy of sin, of Satan, has been defeated? Our hearts are at peace. Here's the truth. Romans 8, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. After Ehud... Israel had peace for 80 years. After Jesus, we have peace forever. It's a victory that we could not win on our own. We are not strong enough. We cannot come up with a better tactic on our own. And that's why God provided one for us. Perhaps against all the odds from a human perspective, God sent His Son to deliver us from our enemies and give us peace for an eternity. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this gift of grace. Thank you for recording events such as Ehud and Eglon, and perhaps as graphic as they are, we see your upper story, reality at work, that you provide deliverance for your people. Lord, we thank you for the work that you've done for us through Jesus Christ and giving us deliverance from our sin. Lord, we know that we are often distracted and this pattern that we see in Judges repeats all too often in our own lives. And so as the Apostle Paul, as we realize the good we want to do, we're not doing, and the evil we don't want to do, we're keep on doing, lead us to a point of despair where we cry out to you and say, Lord, help us because we cannot fix this on our own. And then, Lord, by your grace, remind our hearts and fill our hearts with the reality that we have the victory through Jesus Christ. And we can have peace in our hearts and strength to overcome sin and to face the next battle, not on our own, but with you. Lord, go with us each and every day of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.